The security footage and the live stream that recorded the shooting are chilling. You can see them on the Oregonian's website. The still frame image of Michael Forrest Reinhall, a self-described anti-fascist, pulling his gun. He's hiding in an alcove just inside the parking garage after sundown, drawing his 380 pistol, watching the two Trump supporters walk past. Trump supporters who had been wearing Patriot Prayer baseball caps. A Vancouver-based far-right group known for getting into brawls with left-wingers and attending Proud Boy rallies. Chandler Pappas, one of the Patriot Prayer members, claims he heard someone in the crowd coordinating the attack. He alleges someone shouted to the shooter, we got a couple of them right here, pull it out, pull it out, alerting Michael Reinall. They'd caught the conservatives on foot after the caravan of Trump pickup trucks spraying Black Lives Matters protesters with paintballs and mace had moved on. Whether it was coordinated or not, Michael stepped out from behind the men. He aimed the gun at the Trump supporters and waited for them to turn around. Chandler Pappas and Aaron Danielson faced their attacker. And if you pause the video at the right moment, you can see Aaron draw his can of bear spray. Then there are two quick shots. One bullet hits the can of mace, exploding in a white cloud, and the other bullet goes through Aaron's chest. Aaron stumbles back, walks a few steps, and collapses in front of the oncoming car. Until this moment, whenever two strangers met in Portland to kill each other over wearing red or blue, it was gang beef between Bloods and Crips. Aaron J. Danielson's murder marks the first of several in a year of political killings. A string of gun homicides that were totally unique to this area of politics. An era where two strangers would meet on the street, draw their guns, spill blood, and the media doesn't immediately dismiss it with the disdain and condemnation of a gang killing. Because political killings are unique. Political killings are good for ratings. You're listening to The Reengineered You. This is a podcast about self-empowerment. All the myths, lies, and misconceptions we tell ourselves. Then, we use science and history to bust those myths and re-engineer a better you. I'm your host, Todd Laments, The Extrovert. And I'm the writer, researcher, and introvert, Joe Anthony whose job it is to dig the outer layer of no-duh on the internet. Political cards on the table. I was a registered Republican until 2016. I belonged to a conservative debate club for about half a decade, where we respectfully argued individual policies. That way we never attack somebody's favorite justice or senator. But after 2016, the debate club fell apart. Nobody wanted to discuss solutions or hypothetical laws to replace our failing policies. People started repeating what they heard on the news, which is never a solution, just attacks. I called him a moron. Why don't you go f- yourself, you tiny brain, and I hope this gets picked up, because <laughs> you're a moron. You know the reason why advertisers in this country love the 18 to 34 demographic? Because it's the most gullible. The problem isn't that I don't get what you're saying or that I'm old. The problem is that your ideas are stupid. Conservatives owning the libs. Liberals shouting, how dare you, at conservatives. We got the feeling it wasn't okay to talk policy. Instead, towing the party line became more important than analyzing the issues themselves. If another party runs on medical coverage, well then, who cares about the abysmal state of the medical system? You vote their ass down. Because the party is more important than the policy. This isn't a Republican problem, either. In the last two midterms, Democrats have used existential dread as a way to motivate voters to come to the polls. They wait for something scary to happen, like the leaked abortion draft. And then they use that to remind you, you should have voted Democrat more often. In short, both sides keep pressing the moral outrage button. Both political parties want to scare us into voting for their side. 
but they're using the other half of the nation to bring us to the voting booth. And you can't ring the town alarm every election and every midterm than not expect us to be scared or angry all the time. So that's what our myths are about. Is it healthy for our personal development to be in a political party, especially if they're using moral outrage as a tool? Myth one. How do we allow ourselves to get all whipped up into such a frenzy? What is about moral outrage that's so addictive? Myth two. FDR used to hold fireside chats to unite us. And Teddy Roosevelt talked about how the most important part of politics is realizing we're all American. So what the hell changed? Why is there so much money to be made by keeping us polarized? Myth three. Is picking sides healthy for us? Culturally, we put a lot of stock in being right. But how does that serve our personal well-being? We're going to get into our myths. But first, I want to talk to Joe about the atmosphere around Portland before the shooting. When we started this podcast, Todd and I, we didn't talk about it at first until we got a couple episodes in, but we kind of decided uh, almost tacitly to keep this podcast apolitical. Like we don't, we don't pick sides. Why do you think, I, I still think that was the right choice, by the way. I don't regret that. Um, why do you try to remain apolitical? I know what you mean. When we first started that, then I was thinking, well, are we being honest, right? Yeah. Are we being transparent? But we both don't believe, we believe in politics has become more of a, business and a sport that it is (laughs) yes (laughs) then it really is what i think about is um character values alignment yeah you believe everything that this politician believes so i think it was the right thing to do that's a good way to put it I, i think the reason why um i like to remain apolitical as a podcast is because i have values that haven't really changed in a long time and politicians change their messaging depending on the year. And I know that people grow. Like you're, you're supposed to change what you believe and, and how your values sync up. But honestly, politicians will change their values if their state um, demands it for them to get elected. So or their donors. Yeah, if their donors are asking for something. Um, which, which leads to more votes, which leads to more everything, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the parties will generally support that. They will shift their values. They will. There's a great example of um, Michelle Obama. Was um, she was supporting um, reform for how we advertise food? She went after the food and drug lobby and was like, "Yeah, we're putting sugar and salt in absolutely everything." And then she got a nice paycheck by the you know the craft foods <laughs> or or some like food lobby and then she changed that message to exercise she's like all you <laughs> kids drinking three two liters of soda a day just go out and run it off which doesn't work um and and her base supported it everybody was like yeah exercise let's let's get onto that um i think that's one of the problems too i had with with the election with the, when trump got it just got so nasty. There was such breakups of friends and families, and it became a thing where you have to believe everything they said is right and everything the other side said is is wrong. Exactly. And that just just I don't agree with that in any way. Our debate club used to be a marketplace of ideas, and it was mostly conservatives, a couple of liberals here and there, and we would come and we would talk about strictly the policy. And what happened was in 2016, if you didn't agree with the policy that your party was holding up, then you were out like you, you, they, you would literally be kicked out of the club. And so it, it became a system where we no longer wanted to find the best way to run things. We only wanted to support, you know, what our party said was right. And I don't believe in people. I don't know if I've told you this, but I don't look at any one politician and say, that's my champion. I look at their policies. I say, they, you know, they represent at this moment 13 out of 25 policies I believe in, so I'll vote with them. 
if they if they don't if they change those policies especially as they run and govern then i stop voting for them i don't stick with a person because they're my color that's like a sports team to remind everybody uh i am a registered non-party i don't belong to republican or democrats um, but I want to give a shout out to um, a friend of the podcast and a listener, Sheila Lachance. Um, she contacted us after a uh, the episode about COVID, and she noticed that most of my sources for that episode were liberal sources. Um, and I sent an email back, and I was like, "Yep, um, you know, usually on the podcast we go about sixty forty. We will pull from, um, we have what's called a, a media bias chart, and we will try to sprinkle in both conservative and um, liberal demographics. Like, we get from Gallup polls a lot. Um, we get from news sources that are hard to be biased, like we'll go Washington Post or New Yorker sometimes. Um, but generally speaking, we try to pull from the middle of the chart, um, Reuters, AP News, things like that. Sheila caught Joe's shenanigans and she <laughs> called him out on it. And we appreciate that, Sheila. We love She you. was like, this episode is feeling very liberal. And I had pulled a couple of uh, things from Vox and, and things like that. So, um, And a, a lot of times the reason why we skew a bit liberal in our sources is because they come from colleges. And as we kind of know, a lot of colleges are liberal nowadays. Like they, you know, they, they have more... Majority. Um, yeah, the, the the majority of college educators and the majority of the colleges putting out really good studies also come from liberal minds. So when we do that, we try to make sure it's a study that is um, based around something that would be non-politically motivated. Like when we talk about dating metrics or like, you know, um, self-improvement, self-awareness, those are really hard to you know, have a political opinion on. Usually the opinion is, isn't the human mind interesting? You know, can't we do better as self-awareness goes? Um, and by the way, this is not me being a, a political party a apologizer. It's the opposite. I think picking a political party is foolish. And we were, we're going to get into the history of political parties and how some of our nation's founders believed in in parties. Um, you know, George Washington had a couple of very scathing things to say about polarizing our nation with a two-party system. Um, I will admit right off, I am really into ranked voting, which last year started catching on in a couple of states. Um, so on this episode, because I believe so hard in, in you know, not picking a, a a side, not picking a party like it's a freaking sports team. Todd is usually the one keeping this podcast sounding sane politically. I am the the crazy radical here. I'm the tinfoil hat. <laughs> I believe we need to melt the parties down. So it's up to Todd to keep this on the rails. Someday Joe's going to be a cult leader. <laughs> <laughs> he has a following already. I'm concerned. He's moving to a rural area in Texas, so there might be something going on. <laughs> might if be the you, next Waco. <laughs> if you would just wear the crystal necklace I gave you and start believing in the cat god that is hovering above us all, you, you, we've got a place for you, Todd. It's a weird dude, man. <laughs> Well, we do want to get into our, our history because the next two episodes, we cover two different political killings that happened here in Portland. Um, so I don't want to make this seem lighter than it is. So let's let's get straight to it, if you don't mind. Well, let's talk about this, about as serious as it gets, this killing in downtown Portland. So this podcast is heard all over the world. We live in Portland, Oregon. Everyone, at least in the United States, knows that Portland, Oregon had the longest running riots um, yeah. that happened local. Now, you went down there. You got dressed up and went down there to check it out. You got full-on fatigue stuff, gas mask, and went down. What was your experience? Can you just set the scene before I tell the story? Yes. Um, for anyone that doesn't know, uh, anytime there is a major protest or a big happening in Portland... 
I go in journalistically to record what's happening. I take pictures. I ask questions. Um, I just want to see things for myself and to have recordings and be able to write about it later. Um, so I didn't pick a side. Uh, well, let me Todd's just say right. real quick why I didn't go with Joe. At 46 years old, um, stocky build, six feet tall, I look like a police officer that's off duty. <laughs> I showed you my ID on the way into this podcast just out of reflex. So, <laughs> Yeah, so I didn't go down there because I didn't want to get pistol whipped and stomped to death. So Yeah. And, and, but Joe went down there. Yeah, I, I had a He's bike brave. helmet on and safety glasses. Um, so to give everybody a picture, yeah, I'm sure you've looked at the news. If you, it depends on which side of the news you watch. If you watch, um, CNBC, it was a peaceful protest where innocent people got gassed. If you watch, um, Fox news, Tucker Carl said, said it was a, you know, a violent, he quoted 140 incidences of violence, which most of that violence was just tagging. There was a lot of spray painting stuff. They make it sound like it was the Civil War burning of Atlanta. Exactly. Um, what was actually happening, to give you a picture, there is a park in front of the um, government building in downtown. That park got occupied by, I'm going to be generous and say that it is people who either didn't have jobs at the time or had given up working so they could go to this protest. So there was a hardened core of protesters who looked like Vikings in that park. And there wasn't a lot of them. There was like between 50 and 100 any given moment I went down there. Um, and when I say look like Vikings, like they were like, <laughs> like a couple of them legitimately had on like, like leather skins around their waist and like stripped down their shirt and were like, <laughs> like smoking chests and the tattoos sounds like a halloween party kind it of was <laughs> there was a lot of like they they made riot shields out of foam and tape like duct taped riot shields just for looks yeah it was to stop rubber bullets and i mean it legit looked like a camped army from like a medieval period um and there was like i said there was a, a, a core of about a hundred or so who just wouldn't move like they they anchored things down and they were the most um aggressive like whenever the police would peek out of the building or the um at this point the federal government had showed up the um federal officers they would yell at them they, they would like you know people would stand up in the park and shout and be like here they come um and then on top of this group um other protesters would show up depending on what time of the evening it's kind of like dinner guests there is the host and the host happens to be a viking and then there are a vast you know vastly larger number of people who would show up organized wearing shirts um i was there the night of the mother's march so it was you know 150 moms who wore shirts that said you know the mother's march that was awesome. I remember them the doing spinoffs on that on the uh, Comedy Central. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're moms. They're tough. People come out of their vagina. <laughs> right. <laughs> that was awesome. But Joe was telling me, and I heard this from other several people, that it was so organized that police officers were putting cones up, and then they were um, some of the the protesters were blowing off whistles to say, okay, it's time to begin. Yep. Um the Vikings, let's just call them Vikings, the park Vikings would almost act as spotters. And um, they would radio each other, they'd blow whistles. Um, these groups work together, but it wasn't what either side of the news was representing. It, it was, you know, it, it was a couple of factions that were working together mostly. And it just so happens that that smaller, hardened group of protesters that didn't have anything to do during the day, who just stayed there, they were kind of the the instigators of you know anything that was a little bit more riotous or or crazy for the most part it seemed to be targeted toward businesses there was a lot of spray paint um like i said they would paint everything in town like anything around that park got tagged and spray painted and artwork people would put out stencils and you know uh do a uh almost like a banksy style art piece um, sometimes they would put like wood up on the Apple store and that wood would become a canvas. Like they made beautiful pieces of art, like full portraits that were detailed. 
Um, we'll post a couple pictures from my my photo album if we can. It was crazy enough, and it was. I mean, I we'll get into this in the next episode. Portland is known for protests, so when this happened, people knew what to do. Like like it was like almost like manufacturing they handed out these foam shields and they were giving them away because they just had stacks of them and stencils to paint protest signs onto them so like you would just sit there kind and of an art your fair shield. kind of thing it, yes <laughs> michael's it felt like, art fair promoting it <laughs> it very much felt like a saturday market where it's like here's your shield here's your stencil okay you're good to go <laughs> i'm knitting you a hat to keep you warm tonight yeah it, it was, keeps off it, it keeps off firecrackers too if someone throws a firecracker at you exactly <laughs> um so yeah it, it was not what people imagine is, you know, uh, Mad Max. What it actually was is these factions basically working together, um, and it it was the arrival of the um, the f- you know the federal police or the federal officers that made things sort of go a little bit crazy. It was already sort of getting a little bit crazy, but that's when it was like it brought out people who thought federal intervention was unnecessary to a local protest. And again, we're going to get into the next episode of how much protesting Portlanders do. It's our hobby. We do it every weekend. Um, If you go downtown and you don't see somebody protesting something, it's a weird day. So having Trump send feds in for our protest is kind of like it's an instigation move. Um, Again, I'm not picking political sides. Um, If I were in his position... If I wanted to have a good distraction that day for the news cycle, I would have done the same thing. So this is what happened. There was a man named Justin Dunlap, and he was working until COVID at the Arlene Schnitzer Concert Hall, and that is a place where they have ballets and plays, very artsy. And he'd been doing that for the last 16 years. And he's a father of three, but COVID, they shut, of course, down all concert halls and stuff. So he started to pass time. He's on unemployment. He started going downtown and face uh, Facebook living all these events like a journalist. Okay. So he'd interview himself and he'd say, "I'm in Troutdale right now, following the Black Lives Matters, and they're you know they're protesting and and he just would, would kind of do a journal daily, and he had about sixty to seventy followers is all, and they would watch him every night. It was part of their night. So he was out in the suburbs for a protest for Black Life Matters, and that was winding down, so he decided to go downtown. He heard that there were pro-Trump supporters downtown driving around with paintball guns, shooting people, causing all kinds of chaos, and he meant no one's going to be happy getting shot with a paintball. It hurts like hell, right? Yeah. I. By the way, I, I get asked if I got hit with rubber bullets or tear gas. I actually happened to have... I left... 30 minutes before they tear gas the crowd that night. Um, but in nice case to you're get wondering. that taste in your mouth to tell your kids about it, right? I'm glad I just picked the wrong time. Like, it's it wasn't on purpose. I just happened to not be there when... So the police would tear gas people. Uh, they famously tear gassed our mayor because the mayor was in the crowd with the Mother's March. Um, but on the night we're talking about... They didn't about, mace the moms, did they? Oh, they totally did. Oh, boy. Um, yeah, they they were pretty uh, free tear gas was the word of the day. Um, but when this happened, for the record, it was um, Trump supporters who rolled through and added their own sort of like, it, it, yeah, they were spraying was it paintballs and and bear mace at the crowd just from trucks. <laughs> and, and so that's what happened. So he's down there. And it seemed to, he kind of missed the action. He was like, shit, I missed it. You know, he could still see a few trucks running around. And then there would be protesters yelling at the Trump supporters, who are the more conservative ones, yelling, screaming obscenities, threatening, throwing things. I'm going to kill you, this and that. But And then he happened to catch... Two of the um, Patriot Prayer people? Two pr- Patriot Prayer people walking. And then they got confronted with a man. They sprayed him with bear spray and then he shot at them okay can i ask a couple of questions just personally please if you came in in a trump caravan 
even if it's not Trump, let's let's replace political parties here. We'll say that you are um, Home Depot and I'm Lowe's, <laughs> and and you come in in trucks supporting Lowe's, and you are spraying paintballs and bear spray into the crowd of Home Depot supporters. Would you get out of your truck? Like like these guys were on foot after their caravan had pulled through, screaming, you know. F liberals and and you know like I see, I see what you're saying with one, with one buddy as opposed to fifty of your friends. Right, it's just two guys who were known for being in Patriot Pair. They posted online, and you could easily look them up. Overconfident, a little bit arrogant, and not realizing how probably underestimating the danger. Yeah, these guys had been protesting for weeks, months, so like there was going to be somebody in the crowd that was armed with something. Lots of people. And yeah. very emotionally charged. To remind everybody, this wasn't totally random. This guy planned the shooting. He pulled his gun before he even talked to them. He was kind of hidden behind. A buddy pounded out, hey, there's two of them. Yeah. And he popped out with a loaded weapon, a, a, a heavy caliber <laughs> weapon, um, not just to scare them or not just to hurt them, but to, but to kill. Yeah. It's tough on this Justin Dunlap, the guy that filmed it. I mean, if the dude works at Arlene Schnitzer Hall, he must be used to watching kind of boring stuff. <laughs> I mean, he was traumatized. He what he did was he had the 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 sense to talk to the police and say, "I caught this on tape." He sat down and he was shaking, shivering, and he needed to. Uh, to gain his thoughts because yeah it just see a life taken right before him. This, this is a man who died who was 39 years old in the prime of his life had yeah. his own business now the guy that was killed my buddy is one of his drinking buddies they go to this they went to the same bar and I asked him what he's like and he said he's this is what he said uh, he's an older guy and, and uh, he's like a golf playing Republican <laughs> white guy <Okay. laughs> he said he's not a politically charged guy he's just a blue collar tough guy he's a big physical kid he owns his own moving company talks tough kind of acts tough okay but he's definitely not someone he would think would be over political i've heard people on the news refer to oregon as being a left coast and that we are like a blue haven for other states to give people context we didn't start that way we've lost republicans like myself like moderates in 2006 our state was 36% Republican, which was enough to get people in local offices, especially if you were on the east part of Oregon. E- east Oregon is desert and farmland. and like Yeah, and that's the thing. Our population is heavily in Portland and the suburbs, and we have a big landmass state. So we're yeah. very blue in the city, and we're very red when you get five miles anywhere else yeah (laughs) i mean it's and it's very extreme they're both radical both ways or extreme both ways i would say yeah well it it used to be that we were better represented on both sides that in 2006 um 36 percent of the state was republican now it's like 24 percent uh is republican so like a huge chunk of republicans who were more moderate like like me, I have liberal sensibilities socially. I, I skew conservative with some financial issues. I vote based on issue. I got basically kicked out of the party from my debate club. So did about ten percent of everyone else. Like it's it's not a it, it's not just a minority. It's a small minority. It's it's about twenty four percent. Speaking of supporting your sports team until you're riled up enough to go shoot for them, like pull a gun for them, um, this became a much bigger story. So if you've if you've heard about uh, the Michael Reinald shooting, it doesn't stop there. It isn't just a Republican got shot by a Democrat. It, it gets crazier. Would you mind sharing that? The shooter, Michael Reinald, flees uh, downtown Portland. Um, he goes over to Vancouver. Vancouver, Washington is a different state, but it's it's eight minutes away from downtown Portland. It's just a bridge ride over, so it probably took him 15 minutes. He was hiding out with some friends or family members. He got killed by the police, Portland police, um, 
he was a fugitive. He got cornered. They, they see him coming out of this apartment. They recognize him. They know his Volkswagen car. They have two vans that are right at his Volkswagen car. They see him come out with a duffel bag. They don't say anything to him. They pull guns and they blast away. Two handguns, two rifles, 30 total shots to kill this dude. Through the windshield. Just unloaded on him. That is like a gang. <laughs> yeah. So he did have in his possession, the police said that he was pulled a weapon on them and fired him. He didn't actually pull the weapon. There was a casing, but it didn't go to that, <laughs> to that gun. He was trying to pull his gun out. Okay. Um, they, they were unmarked SUVs, too, by the way. Yeah, black vans pull up. They don't say anything. They sit there, and then gunfire starts. And, and there was no evidence that, that, that Reinald fired a gun outside the car. There's none. There was, a, there was a shell casing that was inside the car, but when he got out of the car where he got killed, there was no. There was no. So it was... Do you call that excessive? It it's suspicious. Um, Thirty shots seems like a lot from that closer range. Without announcing that you're the police, without trying to arrest him. Oh, by the way, the there's another part of this. It was sheriffs, federal officers, and police. So it was like it was a joint task force, and the casing they found was the same caliber as the handgun he used on the Patriot Prayer guys. It was a 380. Um, according to OPB, uh, lots of the Oregon police and sheriff's deputies are members of our uh, right-wing militia. They're part of Oath Keepers. So how hard is it to believe that the people who went to, quote-unquote, arrest Reinald could have been Oath Keepers? They could have been part of the right-wing militia. And, you know, who's to say they wouldn't have put a casing from you know what he had done as a message um that really when i say conspiracy theory i usually use that term you know jokingly this one is uh, we're actually telling you what the internet conspiracy theories say i don't necessarily believe that i think it is possible that they pulled up and held up a hand or tried to indicate in some way that they were the cops but either way you know he he got shot through a windshield without anyone sh shouting, you're under arrest. <laughs> and all the neighbors in the apartment complex kind of te kind of testified to the same thing to the media. So then then you get into the thing, too, or did he have the gun pulled or not? Well, who's saying so? The cops were, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they were the ones. So what do you think they're going to say? Right. Yeah. They see certain people as more dangerous than others. Just your personal opinion. Do you think this was a political assassination? Like you killed one of our Republicans, we're going to kill you? I think you're more emotionally charged when you know the person is a killer. Okay. I think the heart beats a little bit faster. I need a lot more information to make that decision. I think that is such a wise statement in both respects. The idea that you are pulling up on a dangerous suspect known to have a gun, known to you know use it. And yeah, and we don't have all the information. I think that is a very sane way to look at this. Usually when these shootings happen, like if you look at um, the shooting Kenosha, a lot of this seems to be two people who are angry get together and they don't want to argue to convince each other. They want to scream how outrageous the other person is like how how wrong the other side is um so my question to you is do you think that's good for us like do you think moral outrage on some level is is good for us well, i'm trying to think of like primal right <laughs> tribes i'm glad you went there that's exactly what i was kind of asking i didn't say it because i you know my brain is fogged but yeah i, yeah. Think, I think that it kind of it, it puts you in, gives you social standing within your group and maybe gets you some strength and gives you some, I don't know, social power. Yeah. The, what you said there, I, I think that is so incredibly right. Um, I sent you, I and apologize I think that, for this. I think that, and I don't know if it's as much as it used to be, but it used to be a sign of, you know, a higher social class and just intelligence. If you were politically knowledgeable, yeah, it used to be. 
Um, the problem with that is being politically knowledgeable usually meant you read the newspaper and you kept up with politics and you had a lot of good information and then you pick sides. Nowadays, the bar is so much lower to be quote unquote politically knowledgeable. You passively absorb outrageous stuff on Facebook and you think that you are knowledgeable. And so you're like, yeah, calling the president's an idiot makes you, uh, <laughs> it's yeah. not really. A- Put your monocle back in. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so that, that's, that's exactly the, the question I'm asking is tribally is outrage good for us? You know, if we are in a tribe of 40 humans in the you know early era of man, we're, you know, coming out of the cave and we see another tribe across the valley who, you know, maybe it's like Neanderthals or something and we got to go to war on them. It would be a good thing to be able to turn to our tribe and be like, they are hunting all of our mammoths. Mm-hmm. You know, they have killed the gazelles that we were going after today. I think having any kind of a tribe being consistent and having the same goal, um, the same way to look for resources and, and just a consistency is, is good. At any kind of structure. Yeah. There's um, there's a YouTube, um, a YouTuber that makes videos that are very very instructional um they are non-political they're they're mostly about neurology and how information spreads his name is cgp gray um and he has this video that came before all of this political nonsense called how outrage works and basically and and by the way i looked up um communication maps for senators and congressmen and it exactly matches what he's talking about which is um you don't try to take your outrage to the other group most people communicate their outrage to their own group so like if you just imagine like we're discussing the valley where like neanderthals are on the other side of the valley your human group is is in the cave nobody leaves their cave pretty safe space though to push your opinions right Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody in the cave just trades anger and outrage and tells each other how mad they are at the other side. Nobody's crossed the valley in months. Nobody's gone to the other side to discuss this. <laughs> um, but both can, sides. Yeah. Well, what how, what percentage of people do you think are like us, Joe? It's not seen as being an adult if you don't have some kind of political interest. You're seen as not caring or being. Do you know what I'm saying? But I know a lot of people don't really care. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but people, they're not going to say that. They're going to say they're this. They might not even vote, but they act like they do. People act like you don't have convictions if you don't support a side. What I say is you have convictions. You just don't have them for a single leader. And I, I think that is the mistake people make. Um, but nobody, if you want to know how much people cross that valley and leave their own cave of outrage... It's like less than 20% and it's getting smaller. Um, When you look at um, there, there is, we're going to link off to this, the political map of how often um, congressmen and senators reach across the aisle to get bills passed and discuss with each other. They look like CGP's Gray's um, outrage map where a group talks about how angry they are amongst themselves And then once in a great while, two people will leave their cave and meet in the valley and they'll yell at each other. And sometimes they shoot each other like this episode. Um, That's exactly what this episode is really about is, you know, people in the Trump cave, you know, went rolling through in trucks. People in the liberal cave were parked in, you know, downtown Portland. Two people crossed that valley and met in the middle and a gun firing, you know, gunshot was exchanged. Um... They didn't shake hands and go to Starbucks and say, let's talk about this. No, um, but it's for social standing. It, um, so we're going we're gonna to link off to a Scientific American article uh, that's about can outrage be a good thing? Um, and just to sort of be brief and summarize it, um, outrage does exactly what Todd was talking about. It gives you social standing. It makes you sound like you have convictions. It makes you sound knowledgeable. It makes you sound like you are supporting the cause, that you are a tribal leader, and it gets stuff done. In a very limited sense, uh, moral outrage helps you rally, helps you stick to a cause, and it can affect change, Um, especially if your anger comes from a marginalized group. 
if you are in the 26% of conservative Republicans still in Oregon who have kicked out the middle of the road Republicans, you are now in a smaller group and outrage helps you get more cohesive results. When I was in high school, I, we went to, my girlfriend and I at the time, we went to, we had to do a project for school for social studies and it was to go to a, a Democrat camp and then a Republican camp and listen to their um, kind of town hall yeah. pre-election. And we laughed our asses off because at both of them, both the Republican and the Democrat one, they said that it was more important <laughs> who represented their party than it was their what their causes were, what their uh, agenda was. That's exactly the problem. That's so who stupid. was more electable, likable. They said it verbatim, and yeah. we looked at each other like hey, we were kids. You know, we didn't know that that's that's business, right? Yeah, it is. It's sad. <laughs> <laughs> who is who is your tribal leader? Yeah. It doesn't matter what their politics are as long as your side wins. Um the problem we get into with moral outrage, it can be good for you if you know, it, it it can affect results, let's put it that way. Um but the problem is it is addictive as we discussed on our grudges episode. And the big problem is who is pushing that button? Because outrage is a great tool, but left on our own, day to day, we hardly ever get that button pressed. If we're talking about, you know, if, if, if I shut down the internet, I've got a lever here under the desk, Todd. I don't know if I've ever revealed this to you. I pull it. <laughs> it shuts down Facebook and YouTube and, you know, Twitter, the, the biggest culprits of outrage. It, it turns them off. I've never pressed it, but by God, I will. I will turn this internet around. Um, without the internet... We don't get that outrage, hardly ever. You may get cut off by somebody in another car, and you get a tiny dose of that outrage. You get to honk at somebody. <laughs> um, Not as powerful, though. Yeah, we had a guy at work who was stealing lunches, and he got caught, and that asshole got fired, and we were all so happy. And it, I realized that's because that was the only time in the last two years any of us had gotten to like express outrage like we didn't get validated moral outrage except that moment this can't be physically healthy though for our heart and our head to to hate and be angry and upset no we in our grudges episode we shared studies about how if you legitimately hate somebody to the point where you hold a grudge regularly um it causes you physical pain um, uh, it's bad for cortisol. Cortisol goes up in your body, which shortens your lifespan. It's bad for your heart. It's bad for your blood pressure. Just overall sustained hatred. Once your, your outrage level gets to hate, like you're ready to shoot somebody, um, that's when it starts being wildly unhealthy for you. It would be one thing if that was an outlier. If like one in 20 humans got so angry with their outrage that it, it turned into hate. But that's not one in 20. That is all of the news media sites that are trying to get you outraged to get you to click on their stuff. They're pressing that button. It's not one in 20. It's like 90% of us Let's see an are Fox outraged. Or, CNN and Fox and are doing it. Right, exactly. Um, so now we get into a very interesting question. Why are media outlets... Uh, keep pretending that the other sh the other side can be um, shout suaded into realizing their mistake. Um, shouldn't we be more concerned with crossing, you know, leaving our outrage cave, crossing the valley, and talking to the other side? Can we talk at all about the salaries of these news anchors on these major networks? Oh my God, yes. <laughs> I mean, for fuck's sake, Joe, for reading the news that they didn't even write. I'm really glad you mentioned that. Because that is, you you touched on basically the takeaway of um, these two episodes. Um, if you are outraged, in that moment, ask yourself, who is profiting? Bill Maher and Tucker Carlson look really mad when they are shaking their fingers at the other side. Um, but at the end of the day, they both drive home to multi-million dollar houses. <laughs> I looked it up. They both have multiple multi-million dollar houses. <laughs> Jets, estates, salaries that we can't even get our head around. Right. Um, yeah, let's talk a little bit about you know, Facebook and, and you know who makes the most money from you picking sides. 
Um, so there's there's an article by Big Think and this um, you know, Dr. Molly Crockett, who has become almost like a spokesperson for outrage and how outrage works. Uh, she she's from the Yale Department of Psychology, and she talks about how media makes the most money when you are outraged. In fact, um, every word in a tweet that is you know uh, about morals uh, it increases the likelihood of a retweet by twenty percent. So we're we're accidentally giving away the secret to everyone who wants to make their tweets go viral. Every tweet that is a moral word increases your retweet likelihood of 20%. Moral outrage is the most engaging content online. Algorithms will select for your moral outrage material. Oh, so they'll put you to the top. They absolutely do. Well, because they see that your stuff is getting clicked on. Because it works. That's why they did. Yeah. Yeah. So YouTube will move your video to the top. Facebook will make your story more shareable. Um, And those end up being the posts that polarize us the most um i still think there has to be a fix in there i think that the the zuckerbergers know that the the people who actually pay for that okay (laughs) have the deep pocket i don't know that i'm just oh i know that so we had an episode um months ago where we discussed facebook's algorithms and how there's something called um the engagement graph uh, Zuckerberg once had a meeting with his Facebook team and they looked at this graph and they showed that the more morally outraged somebody is, the more time they spend looking at Facebook. Right when they like are at maximum engagement, basically Facebook is making the most money possible off them. Like they're, they're stuck in the stool in front of their computer like it's a slot machine. Like when you see people at a casino where they're sitting there (laughs) zoned out, sitting on a stool looking at the machine and the whirling dials, Facebook does this to people. When people are at their peak engagement, like eight hours a day reading Facebook posts, it is because they have become radicalized. That's Facebook's words. That's not me saying these radicalized politicians. No, it's Facebook knows that you are um, using their service the most right before you go insane, like right before you are radicalized. Um, In fact, uh, the way they put it, right after they reach peak engagement, that's usually when they have to get kicked off of the platform. So the, the, um, the graph looks like a hockey stick. It's the time you spend in the seat being mad goes up, and then suddenly you're posting stuff that is like threats, and you're telling people you're getting your gun and you're telling people that they're sheeple and you're going to see that they die. And that's when you get kicked off of Facebook forever. So like, a local scene here, um, local radio station here, that's a, it's a conservative radio station. It's a talk radio station. And the company I work with is going to do some advertising on there. And I was talking to the advertising rep and he says during the elections, it, business booms, they double their rates people they're they get twice as many listeners people listen longer yeah. so they're doing what you're saying they're really biting down and just <laughs> digging in and who's profiting the radio company right <laughs> and the celebrity um you know the celebrity guests that they have on the shows you want to hear something really crazy about outrage what you're talking about the the way you're talking about it if i learn something from the radio or if i learn something from facebook or twitter I am more outraged than if I saw that in person. This isn't this isn't just my theory. Why? This is from um, University of Chicago did a study about immoral events, and they found out that uh, okay, so here's a good example. My company that I work for right now uh, engages in wage theft. Um, they they will try to get you to work extra without clocking out they've been known to like steal lunches like lunch hours i mean um they've been known to send you out to a job and not pay you overtime because it's technically not with the exact same job site you're working so i was moderately mad at that but then when i read uh, the studies for our episode about wage theft i was so much madder I was ready to take a torch to Amazon. <laughs> I was so angry. Even though you've had money stolen and you're kind of uh, about it, you read and study about it, you're like, I'm going to kill somebody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I found it on Facebook uh, and it was written and it was it was written in such a compelling way and had these amazing graphics and it, it was, yeah, it was designed to outrage. So me seeing it in real life, 
it hadn't been passed around in the cave. It, 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 the outrage cave hadn't taken that message and made it more potent and more efficient, and they hadn't cycled a neat meme image between each other until it was perfect. So I saw wage theft in real life. I wasn't as mad. I saw wage theft online and the memes for it and the Twitter about it and the Facebook about it, and I was ready to shoot somebody. It was crazy. Uh, I'm actually, I'm going to quote from uh, Crockett's article. I think she, she really said it best. <clears throat> she says, quote, I think it's really worth considering and having a conversation about whether we want some of our strongest moral emotions, which are our so core to who we are. Do we want those under the control of algorithms whose main purpose is to generate advertising revenue for big tech companies? So, yeah, your your most powerful emotion in your, your body, the, the big red button at the core of your being, you're letting an algorithm press it. It's not even people. It's not your party. You're not winning and scoring points with, you know, your cave members, your tribe. What you're doing is you're letting an algorithm show you images other people have made over and over and over again and and headlines. It's false, false intelligence, false control. Because that's such a... This is all so politically polarizing to talk about. I'm going to read out loud our sources for these last three points because I want people to look it up. Um, reading this, seeing that algorithms... If you wonder why... Why are we so polarized right now? You know, why why is it that in Teddy Roosevelt's day or FDR's day or any other politician's day, even Bill Clinton, why weren't we at the point where we were shooting each other? Why is it so unique now? It is because of these algorithms. It is because algorithms assign us things to make us angry, like it's homework, and then we just do it. We we sit there and we get outraged because me being angry eight hours a day on Facebook makes Zuckerberg a little bit more money. Um, so we got this from, there's an NPR article, How Outrage is Hijacking Our Culture and Our Minds. There's a science.org article, How Social Learning Amplifies Moral Outrage, Expression Online in Social Networks. And from Yale News, Likes and Shares Teach People to Express Moral Outrage Online. Seeing this, seeing how outrage makes so much money for people and how algorithms push headlines and pictures at people that will make them angry. It's kind of like seeing a high school play and realizing that all the set pieces and costumes, everything that's been sewn together behind the scenes are made from our old wardrobes. Like it, like you, you, you start recognizing, Oh, that's my coat from last year. That's my, that's my pants. The, hey, that's my curtains from the kitchen. You realize these algorithms have taken our tribal mechanisms built into us and sewn them together into this profitable entertainment and political system. And it's violating to see that. I'm sorry to say it again, but if you feel morally outraged when you're watching the news, if you're watching Tucker Carlson or Bill Maher and you feel mad, just ask yourself, who's profiting right now? Those two are driving home to million dollar houses. Guess who's not? Todd and I found um, an article long after the Danielson killing. Um, and it's it's basically like, even with the retribution killing or, or the failed arrest, whichever way you see it, um, even with that, the story hasn't really ended. So what's what's happening now? I'm sorry to ask. Well, this is this is <laughs> this is a sign of the times, and maybe not, but it's a big lawsuit. So Danielson, this is the man who shot the right wing guy in downtown Portland, who went to back to his home in Vancouver and got killed by police. Danielson, his family. So the two participants in the shoot off are dead. One They're killed gone. one, and then the cops killed the other one. The one that cop killed, guess who his family's suing? The other family? You would think, right? Yeah. They're suing the downtown Portland, the Portland uh, government, Portland police, for the streets of Portland not being safe and allowing all these protests to go on, or this whole thing wouldn't have even st happened in the first place. So they have a nerve to sue the city. <laughs> So 
that is that it's is hard so crazy. to say because it's hard for me to get it through my head. <laughs> yeah, the, the both participants are now dead, and now the families are going after the city, or the the Danielson's family is going after the city. Their son, grandson, went downtown Portland to kill somebody on a mission with help with a weapon, and they're saying that it's the police's fault because they had to hands off all these. Um, and there's a lot of people who believe this, that the the police in Portland, the government in this state has been very, very soft on protesters. Oh, I mean, yeah, I believe that. Um, the The protests, like I said, our city has a long history of protests. Our general take on protests is to let it happen. Um, we We have a long history of like let them exhaust themselves and that seems to be the kind of method that they chose well the attorneys wrote up a real fancy term for it and they fostered this was that's called quote they portland has fostered a culture of vigi- vigilante vigilante policing now how much are they suing for right how much oh god um this is where there's no way i'm not going to be shocked by this but like <laughs> a wrongful death suit is like a million or two 13 million in damages. Okay. 1.5 in economic damages, which would probably be his salary for the rest of his life. 1.5 That's, that's the number I thought was gonna, I was going to hear. Yeah, 1.5 million in non-economic damages, which I'm not sure what that is, and 10 million in punitive damages. And as we've talked about before on the show, lawsuits aren't about changing the law or right or wrong. They're, they're more about just cashing in. That's what it strikes me as. If this was about changing laws they would have targeted somebody that wasn't just the city. Like, uh, I don't know. It, do you think Portland is going to see this lawsuit and be like, you're right, we should fight protesters tooth and nail. It's like... Depends how good the attorneys that they've got are. Yeah. If they don't let it go, they'll probably settle for it for $5 million and that'll be that. It is really easy to imagine that lawsuits like this um the the protests how crazy they got how many windows got broken um people are assuming that that's why portland is vacant why so many businesses have moved out of downtown it's not we had a a record year in 2018 of losing businesses they've been moving out of downtown because of the homeless for years uh columbia sportswear specifically in a they were quoted in an article saying that they moved out because of the quote feces problem that they got tired of people literally taking dumps in front of their front door downtown and there was also economically um i know a bunch of restaurants in one of the more desirable areas the pearl district they just couldn't the rents were so high the leases were so high that they couldn't turn a profit even gourmet restaurants yeah so everyone that looks at downtown is like they fled because it's a war zone. It's like, no, it's actually because um, homeless shit. and... Yeah, it was shit before that. Yeah, it was, yeah. <laughs> it was already in. <laughs> yeah, it, all those, yeah, all that spray paint on the overpasses and along the railings, that wasn't the protest. That was that was there. <laughs> generations we've lived in America where someone in the government, usually the president, will try to slow the political polarization. This hasn't happened much recently. During his presidency, Trump made it pretty clear he didn't care about peace with liberals. And on May 4th, Biden called the conservatives the most extreme political group in history. What if the real danger facing America isn't the other political party? What if the real danger is the big red button news media and politicians keep pushing to convince us to vote and tune in? What if the real source of polarization isn't coming from liberals or conservatives, but from the algorithms that hijacked our moral outrage for money? Or to quote George Washington, political parties may now and then answer popular ends. They are likely in the course of time and things to become potent engines by which cunning, ambitious, and unprincipled men will be able to subvert the power of people and to usurp for themselves the reins of government, destroying afterwards the very engines which have lifted them to unjust dominion. So that's the lesson Joe and I are taking away from the research. To gird our emotions. To make our outrage bulletproof. Our morals are permanent after all. 
whereas the politicians who hijack them are temporary employees of the people and will be gone in four years or less. To put it another way, if you're watching the news or Twitter and you feel outraged, ask yourself, who's getting paid right now? Because if you have to ask, it's not you. You've been listening to The Reengineered You. Thank you so much for listening to the show. You mean the world to us. We have a new episode every week. You can connect with us at www.re-engineeredyou.com. That's where we have research links, show notes, feedback, and blog articles for every episode. We're not experts in anything, but we've got an opinion on everything. Mm-hmm.